We just got uh, Emerson a new bike this past week and it got me thinking about well, all the times I, I spent on my bicycle when, when I was his age and you know I was, I was on my bicycle a lot, like I mean a lot. My friends and I were like this little biker gang on Limekiln Road and you know I loved the bikes that I had and I got thinking I remembered one bike in particular, it was a, it was a BMX that was black and it had le red lettering on it and, and it worked really good. And it was one of my one of my favorite bikes, and one of the favorite things to do on that bike was to to hit jumps, and, and I'd jump jump off of anything that I could. You know, I was a, a superstar bike rider in my own mind, anyway. So so one day I had this superstar bike rider idea. I thought of a of a great jump. It was going to be legendary. You see, at the at the time our garage didn't have a roof on it. The lower half was just like you would imagine a two car garage would be. Uh, just that the, the top of it was flat. There was no roof on it at the time. And we didn't put the rafters up or anything like that until a couple, couple of years later. So it created this great platform to, to play on up there. It was about 12 feet high, which is, is too far to, to jump off of on a BMX bike as a kid. You know, I wasn't crazy. That's way too high. But 
You see, beside the garage, the, the ground kind of rises up, uh, you know, quite a bit. So if you get enough speed and you jumped out far enough from the side of the garage, it would really only be like jumping down, you know, seven or eight feet. So, which is perfectly fine for a, a kid to jump a BMX bike off of. So, that was my plan. I, I tied a rope around my bike and I climbed up the ladder to the top of the garage and I hauled my bike up and I rode around for a little bit just to kind of get the, the feel of things. I, I rode to the edge and it seemed a lot higher, you know, from the, than it did from the ground. So, but I thought, you know, it's still doable. I, I, I made a quick look over at the house to make sure that mom wasn't looking out the window or anything like that. And then I went and I lined myself up with the, the perfect landing area so I wouldn't be that far down. And I, I sat there for a second and I took a couple of deep breaths and before I could talk myself out of it, I started pedaling as fast as my little legs could go. And as I reached the edge, uh, I knew I was committed. There was no turning back now. I was in for the long haul and I, I launched off the edge and I was airborne. It was, it was epic, it was legendary, I was flying. Now, in reality, the, the flight was over in a second, but at the time it seemed like I was in slow motion. It was great right up until I connected with the ground. And I connected hard. I, I had greatly overestimated the distance I thought I could fly from the garage. I didn't nearly go far enough. And when I collided with the, the ground at top speed, my little bike didn't handle things very well at all. My little BMX wasn't quite designed for such an impact and the front forks just kind of couldn't take the strain and it quickly buckled under the pressure and bent forward making my little bike look like a chopper motorcycle. I hit the ground so hard it, it knocked the wind out of me and then I hit the ground and I flew off the, the, to the left of the bike and I rolled onto the grass and I, uh, I laid there for a while trying to, to catch my breath. Miraculously, I didn't have any broken bones and I was only slightly bleeding from one arm and I eventually got up and, and I looked at my bike. It was a, it was a complete write-off, totally ruined. I hadn't thought of how the jump would affect my bike. My, my dumb decision ruined my, my favorite bike. It was, it was toast. You know, so often we don't, we don't calculate how our decisions will affect others around us. We, we just think about us and, and who we are and what we want to do and how things will affect us. We should always be mindful of the effect of, of our words and our actions on not just ourselves, but on everyone around us. You know, we, we need to be mindful of if our words are, are building people up or if they're making people buckle like my bike under the impact of them. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21 that the, the tongue has the power of life and death. We, we need to think things through. We, we need to be sure that our actions and our words line up with our walk with Jesus Christ. We need to, to weigh out the cost. We need to weigh out the effects. We need to, to reflect Jesus in our life with words and actions. We need to, you know, the, the world around us to know who Jesus is and, and not tear people down. You know, think your actions through. Jesus did. You know, he, he weighed the cost of walking into Jerusalem. He knew the impact of his actions. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that the cross was going to happen. He knew all that he would have to, to suffer through. He calculated the cost and willingly went through it all so that the, the weight of the world would no longer crush us. So that, that we could stand up against anything the enemy would, would throw our way. And we, we gather and we take communion to remember all that Jesus has done for you and me. And we have to be sure that we never take that for granted. Be mindful of our choices every single day, just like Jesus Christ was. Now this time I'm going to, to pray over these emblems and the emblems of yours at home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you have freed us. We thank you that your actions have taken the weight of the world off of our shoulders. God, I pray that you would help us to be more like you. I pray that you'd help us to be mindful of our, our words and our deeds, to make sure that everything lines up with you, that we build people up, that we don't crush people under the weight of our words and actions, that, that everything we say and do reflects you in our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to be more like Christ every day. I pray that you would bless these emblems. God, I pray that, that you would help us to never take that for granted, never take Christ's broken body and his shed blood for granted in our lives to always cling to all that he has done for us. God, I pray that you would uh, be with us and guide us every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a fellowship! What a joy! To This morning, I want to, to look at a passage from Paul's first letter uh, to the Christians in, in the city of Corinth. You know, evidently, Paul, uh, from this passage, is, is tired. He's already spent more than, than eight years on his first two missionary journeys, working tirelessly, preaching the gospel, starting, he was starting churches. He was facing a lot of opposition, you know, sometimes even having to, to flee from those wanting to kill him. Now he's in, in a city called Ephesus. He's on his third missionary journey, <clears throat> excuse me, and he, 
He was writing to, to the church in Corinth from Ephesus. And Paul, Paul didn't know it when he wrote these words, but God, God was opening up a, a great door for him in Ephesus as he was writing this. In fact, Paul ends up staying there for three years. And God not only used Paul to start a great church in Ephesus, but while he was there, many, many more churches were started in the, in the towns around Ephesus. And it became the, the center from which the gospel flowed uh, around the great area around there. So, you know, he, he saw whenever a door was opened for him to, to step into it. When God was about to do something, Paul recognized that. And, and, and he would always see one of three things. So let's, let's look at this passage now from 1 Corinthians 16, 5 to 9. And we'll stay there all morning. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 5 to 9. And it says... After I go through Macedonia, I, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door of effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. So, from this passage, we, we, we see a few things. But firstly, Paul recognized a door of opportunity. A door of opportunity. Let's look at the first part of uh, verse 9 again. 1 Corinthians 9a. And it says, Because a great door of effective work has opened to me. Because a great door of effective work has opened to me. So, Ephesus was a, was a tough city. It was difficult to evangelize to. People there were extremely superstitious. And there were many fortune tellers and soothsayers all over that city. It boasted one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, actually, the, the Temple of Diana, which was a temple full of, of impure things that were happening there. It was, it was not a city where Christians would want to live or, or could live easily. But when Paul looked at Ephesus, he saw this great door of opportunity that God was beginning to open for him. He, he thought he would stay there a while and, and take advantage of this opportunity. God revealed that there was so much work to do there, opening a door of opportunity for him to, to spread the gospel. There were so many people that needed to hear about Jesus. He needed to share the gospel with them. God was, was giving him this opportunity. He was opening this door. And he had to step into that opportunity. Uh, Dr. Paul Brandt wrote about his, his parents who were, were missionaries in India. He said for years they saw almost no converts. Due primarily to a Hindu priest who warned the people in that village that if they, they listened to the Christians there, their cattle would die. And sure enough, the cattle of those who came to the Christian chapel did die. But only because the priest was poisoning them. And as a result, almost no one would listen to the gospel there. Discouraged, the, the Blance, uh, his father uh, at times doubted his calling. But following World War I, a terrible flu epidemic took the lives of, of thousands in India. And many of them died from, from dehydration. And Dr. Brand's parents uh, cooked huge vats of soup and, and took it in buckets to the afflicted. And when the wife of the Hindu priest became ill, the Brants lovingly ministered to her but she also died, and when the priest himself became ill, the branch brought him soup and, and attempted to assist him. But before he died, he asked the branch to adopt his daughter. He told them, all my life I have served my people, but now that I am hurting, no one comes to me but you Christians. I don't want my daughter to grow up as a Hindu. Now, we all have, have a great opportunity today. There are many people around us that that don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. There, there's a door of opportunity here for the gospel to be shared. Like Paul, we need to, we need to seize that opportunity to, to be intentional about going out and telling our friends, our neighbors, and everyone else about the love of God and, and salvation that's only possible through Jesus Christ. God opens doors of opportunity for us, but we need to recognize them and, and be, be brave enough to step through those doors. Like Paul, we need to, to look for those opportunities. Be in tune with what God is doing in your life. See his hand at work. Look for those doors of opportunity. So firstly, Paul recognized that there was this door of opportunity. And secondly, he saw that it was uh, a door of obligation. 
a door of obligation. So look at verse 9a again, and look at a, a, one important word that Paul uses. It says, because a great door of effective work has opened to me. Because a great door of effective work has opened to me. So not only did Paul see a door of opportunity, he also saw a door of obligation in Ephesus. He, he said a, a great door of effective work is open to me. Me. He didn't say it open for Timothy or, or Titus or, or someone else. He took it personally. That God had opened this door for him. He felt obligated to share with the people of Ephesus. The city, the city needed desperately to know who Jesus is. He knew that God had plans for Timothy and Titus on their own, but he couldn't do their work for them. He could only do the work that was set before him. And that was this opportunity. This was his opportunity. He saw God opening this door for him, and he saw that calling as an obligation that he wasn't about to miss this calling. He, he felt obligated by God to step through this door, to help the Ephesians, to, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. I heard of uh, missionary James Hudson Taylor in, in challenging his students of, of his day to be involved in missionary work. He used to tell them about Peter, his Chinese convert and, and disciple. In one of their, on one of their sea journeys, Peter, who, who did not know how to swim, unfortunately fell overboard. Fortunately, though, there were Chinese fishermen nearby just, just to grab away from where Peter fell. Taylor shouted at the fishermen and, and asked them desperately to help Peter. Help my friend! He's drowning! However, the fishermen paid no heed to his call because they, they were busy loading their catch from their nets in their boat. Taylor desperately yelled even louder, Stop! Please! Help my friend! He's, he's just a grab away from you. But the fishermen continued their work until the last fish was loaded. Then they jumped in and got Peter out of the water. They, they tried to revive him, but it was no use. Peter had drowned. He could have been saved, but they, they just waited too long. Then Taylor turned to his students, and he would ask what they thought about the, the Chinese fishermen. Some of, them, some of them said they were bad and evil and selfish men for being so unconcerned about saving the dying man. But Taylor responded, I, I see it differently. I think the Chinese fishermen were like most Christians today, who are unconcerned about the plight of sinners who are just a grab away from them, saying they're just too busy to spread the gospel. Now we, we have doors uh, open to us daily by God. We have an obligation as Christians to go through those doors and, and save the people who are drowning in a sea of sin all around us. Those around us who don't know where to turn or, or who can help. We have an obligation to share our experiences with Jesus and how much His love and His salvation is for them as well. To reach out to them and pluck them out of the darkness of this world. We may not have much time left. The Lord could return at any moment. Soon it may be too late to help. As Christians, we are obligated to, to help just as much as Paul was in Ephesus. Now, will you step through the door that God opens for you? Do you feel obligated to do that? Do you feel the urgency like Paul did? So Paul saw this, this door of opportunity open. He felt obligated to step through those opportunities that God was giving him. But he also realized that this was going to be a door of opposition. A door of opposition. Let's look at the last part of verse 9 again. 1 Corinthians 16, 9b. And he says... And there, were, there are many who oppose me. And there are many who oppose me. So the Apostle Paul also saw a, a door of opposition. He, he said there's many who oppose me. In Ephesus there was a, there was a guy named Demetrius who made, uh, made and sold silver idols. Because that was a huge trade there. And when the gospel was proclaimed and, and people became Christians and they met Jesus, they, they stopped buying idols from him naturally. So Demetrius was losing a lot of business, and he was losing a lot of money. And he was upset at this new upstart religion that was digging into his wallet. So he became an enemy of the gospel, and he started persecuting Paul terribly and very intensely. Paul knew there was a lot to be done in Ephesus. He knew that God had opened this door for him. But he also knew that there was opposition all around him. It wasn't going to be easy. He knew that there were obstacles in, in his way every single day. But Paul kept pushing on. He, he kept working. And eventually the church in Ephesus and the surrounding area began to flourish 
with the Christian faith. The gospel spread. Lives were changed. God moved in powerful ways. Paul worked hard despite the opposition that was surrounding him. You know, whenever I'm, I'm planning an event uh, for church and, and we find often we get opposition because the enemy, Satan, is trying to prevent us from, from God moving, from something great happening. You know, he doesn't want people to hear about Jesus. And I, I remember particularly planning a, a concert at a church I used to work at. And, and everything that could go wrong did. The, the band got lost and they arrived late. Uh, we had a hard time getting the sound system all set up. Uh, a few of the church board members didn't like the band's style of music. And, and they didn't want anything to do with it and wouldn't help. The, the high school actually at the last minute planned another event for the same night. It was just like obstacle after obstacle was trying to stop this from happening. But we just kept working and we kept doing everything that needed to be done. Satan didn't want, didn't want it to happen, but, but we worked hard anyway. And eventually it all came together at the last minute, just in time. And, and the, the event was a huge success and three people ended up giving their hearts to the Lord that night and, and decided to follow Jesus. You know, we, we didn't stop even when it was difficult. We just kept plugging on, knowing that the enemy was working against us. You know, as, as you get braver and, and you get more courageous in your faith and step through the doors of opportunity and obligation that God places in front of you, you will face opposition. Whenever God's people begin working for the Lord and, and people are coming to Christ and people meet Jesus, the enemy will oppose you. He will try to stop you. He will try to discourage you. But don't be dismayed because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God has created you to be an overcomer, to, to be more than a conqueror. Keep working, keep, keep sharing, keep loving in the face of, of the opposition and you'll find God's protection is, is constantly around you and your work will be blessed. Just don't give up. And in closing, are you looking for the doors God is opening in your life? Doors Doors of opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Doors to help people and be God's hands and His feet in this world. Don't shy away from, from what God is calling you to do. Trust Him and, and step through the doors that He opens for you. But maybe, maybe you're watching this morning you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God is calling you. Make that decision today. Step through that door. This is the greatest decision you can ever make in your entire life. Where you spend eternity depends on it. Talk to me or another believer that can help. You will not regret it. Or maybe you're like me and you've been walking with Jesus for a while now, but, but don't always step through that door when God opens it. You've, you've seen opportunities to talk to somebody about Jesus. You've seen opportunities to, to pray with someone who's going through a difficult time, but you're too afraid or, or, or too uncomfortable to step through that door. I want to encourage you this morning that, that God hasn't given up on you and He hasn't stopped opening those doors in your life. Trust Him and step into the unknown. Continue to walk with Jesus and make that the greatest priority in your life. Trust God more and more. Get into His Word every single day. Talk to Him constantly and never ever forget that God loves you.